full screen there. I'm going to move this over here. All right. So what I'd like to talk about is a little bit of the differences between the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, I think the polar regions are regions that a lot of people aren't familiar with. And then the other thing I want to do is just show you some animals. If you ever get the opportunity to go to Antarctica or to go to the Antarctic Peninsula or go to the Arctic, which if you do, I, I highly recommend it because they're amazing places. I'll be showing you some animals that you're likely to see there and talk a little bit about the, the natural history of the animals there. Okay, let's see if I can get my PowerPoint alive. When I first went to Antarctica, it was because a friend of mine said, hey, let's go to Antarctica. And I thought I knew nothing about it and said, well, okay, that sounds kind of kind of neat. And so sound, signed up for the trip knowing absolutely nothing about it. And when when I went down there, I, I was absolutely blown away by the beauty. I, I did not know that ice could be so beautiful. And both the Antarctic region and the Arctic regions are, are probably some of the last true wilderness areas left on the planet. And, uh, and again, I was just blown away by the beauty of the areas. This picture was taken on a Zodiac ride near uh, Devil Island off the Antarctic Peninsula. And then this picture was taken in, in the Svalbard archipelago up in, uh, up in the Arctic. And when I taught marine biology, I would, I would show this picture to my students and I'd say, you know, well, this is a Christmas decoration that's always bothered me. And I I'd go, well, what's wrong with this picture? And I, most of the time, the classes, I'd get no response at all. Once in a while, I'd get a response. But uh, I do not care for this Christmas decoration because you don't find penguins and polar bears in the same hemisphere. Uh, polar bears are associated with the Arctic and penguins are associated with the Antarctic and, and then they can be as found as far north as the Galapagos. And in fact, the term Arctic comes from the Greek word arctos, which means bear, and Antarctic means anti-bear. And so you aren't going to find polar bears or any land predator in the Antarctic regions, whereas you have lots of uh, land predators in the Arctic regions. And so to look at some of the differences, um, when you go to Antarctica, well, Antarctica is this huge continent. Uh, for a lot of people that go there, it's their seventh and last continent they visit. And so it's this huge continent that's surrounded by an ocean I refer to as the Southern Ocean. If you go to the Arctic, the center of the Arctic is the world's smallest ocean, and it's completely surrounded by continents. And so that's one major contrast between the two areas. And typically, if you go to Antarctica, most people that do a trip to Antarctica visit the Antarctic Peninsula. The, and unless you're doing research, you probably aren't going in, in some of these areas in here. And so, there are no polar bears. When I went to Antarctica, when I went to the Antarctic Peninsula, my brother asked me to take pictures of polar bears. Well, there aren't polar bears in the Antarctic. The only mammals in the Antarctic are marine mammals. And so the, your top predators in the food chains in, in the Antarctic are basically seabirds and marine mammals. Whereas there's numerous species of land mammals if you go to Arctic regions. Um, you have large herbivores. This is a, the endemic, uh, fairly small reindeer called the Svalbard reindeer. You have small predators like the Arctic fox. And then you have the apex predator, the, the world's largest mammalian predator, which is the, uh, the polar bear. And so when you go to Antarctica, it's, or when you go, it, most of you, if you went, you would go to the Antarctic Peninsula. The animals, because there's no predators, the animals have no fear of you. Now you're required to keep a distance. And um, when you get off, off the zodiacs and you go on land to photograph animals, but a lot of times the animals will approach you because they're curious. And this Weddell seal didn't approach me, but I just sat there quietly and he just kept looking at me like, what is this weird mammal? that's, you know, hanging around me here. And when you look at the birds, they can look somewhat familiar, but this is a penguin and a daily penguin that you would see in the Antarctic Peninsula. And this is a thick bill mirror that I photographed in the Arctic in the Svalbard Archipelago. And although they look quite similar, 
um, they're not closely related. They're in different families. And their nesting habits are, are quite different because of the predators. Uh, these thick-billed mirrors that I, that I photographed in Svalbard, and typical for seabirds in the Arctic, they nest precariously on cliffs to get away from predators because there's Arctic foxes and, and other predators that will take the chicks and eggs. And here in Antarctica, when you go on different islands of, in the Antarctic Peninsula, you'll, if you go during penguin breeding season, there's penguins all over the place. And boy, you can smell them, you can see them, you can hear them. But again, absolutely no fear. And you have to keep a distance, but if you stand there and you're, if you stand there quietly, a lot of times the penguins will actually approach you. But if you are in a, a penguin colony like this, if you're a penguin, you do want to be in the middle because there are predators, there are things like south polar skuas will come in and they'll take the chicks and eggs at the edges of the colonies. And then during the breeding season, um, you have leopard seals that will cruise the beaches and take penguins as they're coming in from the sea to feed their chicks. But in terms of having land predators, you have no, no land predators in the Antarctic Peninsula. Another huge difference is the Antarctic continent is a huge continent and you have this huge Antarctic ice sheet that super cools the area. And so similar latitudes will look quite different because of the, the cooling that goes on from that Antarctic ice sheet. So I took this picture in the Le Maire Channel um, off the Antarctic Peninsula at 64 degrees south. And then I took this picture in the Svalbard Archipelago, even closer to the pole at 79 degrees north, and quite a bit of difference in terms of the kinds of, you know, the vegetation and things. And in terms of vegetation, the Arctic tundra has hundreds of species of flowering plants and thousands of species of insects. And it, one thing that I did notice, uh, this, this species and some other species, this is a mountain sorrel. And uh, some of the species you see at sea level in the Arctic tundra, if you hike in the Sierra and you get up to alpine regions, you'll see some of the same species in the Sierra. And I've seen this species many times in the, in the Eastern Sierra. In the Antarctic, there's only two species of flowering plants and almost no flying insects. So you never have to worry about mosquito repellent or getting bit by flies or, or anything like that when you're in Antarctic regions. They do have large, both have large marine mammals. Pinnipeds include seals, sea lions, and walruses. Walruses are only found in the Northern Hemisphere and in the, in the Svalbard region, they have the Atlantic walrus and it's a big animal. They can get as, uh, uh, they can weigh as much as 3,500 pounds. Then these um, elephant seals were actually photographed off of South, South Georgia. And these are absolutely huge. Large males can get up to 8,000 pounds. If you ever get the opportunity to go to the Antarctic Peninsula, I would encourage you to spend the extra money and the extra time and take the longer trip that includes South Georgia and the Falkland Islands. Because it takes a lot of money and energy to get down there. And it does take more money and time to uh, see South Georgia and the Falklands. But uh, if it's gonna be a once in a lifetime trip, um, I would not want to skip South Georgia and the Falkland Islands. Because if you're going to the Antarctic Peninsula, you're going to go to the very southern tip of South America, the southernmost town in the world is Ushuaia. And then you'll go across Drake's Passage, which is famous for its rough seas. And then you would visit the Antarctic Peninsula, and then you'd go back. And that is a much shorter trip than if you took off and you went to the Antarctic Peninsula. If you decided to do South Georgia and the Falklands, it, the trip is about 21 to 22 days. You would most likely make stops at Elephant Island, which is uh, famous with the Shackleton Expedition and a very interesting place historically. Uh, you'd visit the South Orkney Islands and hopefully you'd spend at least three days on South Georgia and then you'd end up in the Falkland Islands. And you see lots of different things uh, in South Georgia and the Falkland Islands than you do down into the Antarctic Peninsula. 
So to get there, you cross Drake's Passage, again, famous for its rough seas. Uh, we were very lucky. We had very calm seas when we crossed Drake's Passage. And then as soon as you cross the Antarctic Convergence, you're actually in what I call the Southern Ocean. And the Southern Ocean is an ocean that is not recognized in my marine text, marine biology textbook, but I, I think it, it deserves the distinction of a separate ocean. And you know you've crossed the Antarctic Convergence when you get a big drop in sea temperature. And that big drop in sea surface temperatures uh, means a lot biologically, because here you can see the Antarctic convergence. And in this picture, you can see this, these sort of fuzzy yellow areas, and that represents swarms of krill. And krill, this is, a, this is my finger, and this is krill, it's a, a crustacean, but it's a keystone species because it's such an important food source for so many animals that live in the area. And so, and so as soon as we crossed the Antarctic um, convergence, as soon as we were actually in the Southern Ocean, we saw, started seeing different albatross species, uh, wandering albatross, black-browed albatrosses, uh, cape petrels, incredible seabirds. I mean, the seabird density, we spent a lot of time off the back of the ship just uh, and it's not hard to learn the birds. You don't have huge diversity. You have high numbers, but you don't have great diversity. So a, a lousy birder like me, I'm not a very good birder, can actually learn the birds in these areas fairly quickly. And of course, climate change has had an impact in both regions. Uh, climate change is uh, impacting the polar regions about three times the rate that it's uh, affecting other areas of the world. And, uh, and climate change is causing a decline in sea ice. And, and that's a huge problem because sea ice is very important for the ecology of the area. Because a, a lot of, for example, the, the juvenile stages of krill actually feed on algae or phytoplankton that grow on the underside of the sea ice. And in the last 30 years, there's been an 80% decline in krill abundance uh, attributed to a loss of sea ice. And that's had an impact on, in the Antarctic Peninsula, the Adelie penguin is the, the southern of the three penguins you find there. The Adelie has the southernmost distribution and their, their numbers are decreasing and their range is, is being forced further and further south because of this decline in sea ice. And so in the Antarctic region, you have two main uh, groups of seabirds. You have tube noses and you have penguins. And I think most everybody is familiar with penguins. They're flightless diving birds. Uh, they differ from typical birds because they have heavy bones, solid bones that serve as ballast. Whereas the birds we have around here have hollow, really light bones. Think of that bone on the chicken leg you, you had for lunch if you ever eat chicken. Uh, they have a fat layer under the skin. Uh, depending on their distribution, they will eat fish. Uh, the Adelies eat mostly krill, they will eat squid, squid, and they feed in a manner that's referred to as pursuit diving, where they chase their prey underwater. The, the penguins literally fly underwater chasing their prey. And then the tube noses are a really interesting group of birds too. Um, their nostrils, this is a southern giant petrel, and their nostrils are fused in a tube on the top of their bill, and it can be seen really easily on this species. Um, they are very skillful flyers, and they will often spend years on the open sea before coming to land. They're surface feeders. They eat fish or squid at the sea surface, and we, we'll talk about why that can be a problem sometimes. Uh, they have a fantastic sense of smell, and that helps them find food in the open ocean. The open ocean is really a biological desert. Most of the world's fisheries are off the coast, where you have nutrients washing in from runoff and, and streams. Uh, most of the open ocean does not have nutrients and does not support much, except in areas where they have upwelling, where nutrients come up from the bottom. And, uh, and I'll talk in a little bit about how that sense of smell helps them find the organisms that are associated with those upwelling areas. And then these guys live a, a really long time, 40 to 70 years. Actually, there's a, a Laasian albatross na named Wisdom 
uh, from the Hawaiian Islands set last February, February 2021, uh, laid an egg at 71 years of age. And so uh, pretty amazing how once these guys reach adulthood, if they can make it to adulthood, they live a very, very long time. I think one of my favorite birds in the world is uh, the wandering albatross. Um, I just, it's uh, physiologically and anatomically, it's, it's an amazing bird. It's a beautiful bird. It's the largest of the albatrosses. It, weighs, it can weigh around 22 pounds. Its wingspan can be up to 11 feet. It spends most of its life at sea. And uh, it's a surface fe uh, feeder feeding primarily on squid, which in the Southern Ocean, feed mostly on krill. And notice how narrow these wings are. The, they do a type of flight. They don't do flapping flight like the kinds of birds you see around here. The, you'll only find albatrosses where you have strong winds in the open ocean. They, they truly are pelagic birds. They're birds of the open ocean. And they don't expend a lot of energy flying because they do a thing called dynamic soaring. And this is a little diagram showing wind speeds and the higher you get from the sea surface, the greater the wind speed. You can think of that if you're hiking, if it's a windy day and you hunker down and get close to the ground, it doesn't feel as windy as you're standing up. And so what these guys would do is when they start losing elevation, they'll turn around and they'll face the wind and they'll gain altitude. They aren't flapping their wings at all. And once they gain altitude, they'll then turn and glide and go a little further, hit the sea surface, maybe grab some food if it's available, or maybe not hit the sea surface if they're looking for food. They get close, they turn around, they go again, gain, alt gain altitude, and then glide down. And so they aren't flapping their wings at all. And so it's not a direct line flight. But with radio transmitters, they found uh, some of these guys will cover 3,000 miles in 10 days um, or 3 million miles in a lifetime. And, and that, you know, that's an, a kind of an odd number. I mean, it's, it's something I can't really relate to, 3 million miles in a lifetime. But if, to put it in perspective, imagine flying back and forth to the moon six times and a bird that is doing that in their lifetime. And so anatomically, they don't expend much energy because they will spend years out at sea without, without uh, coming to land. And so they actually have a way to lock their wings in place where it doesn't take energy, energy to hold their wings out. If I asked you to stand up and hold your arms out to your side, you would get tired very quickly. I used to do this with my students when I talked about this kind of stuff. And so if you think about the chicken breast that you eat, the pectoral muscles, the chicken has pretty big breast muscles. These guys have very, very small pectoral muscles. There's not a lot of muscle in here because they aren't doing flapping flight. And they're surface feeders. So albatrosses in the, in the Southern Ocean are primarily taking squid from the sea surface. But anywhere where, there, any, anywhere where there's albatrosses, some of them will take fish from the sea surface, and, and that's a problem with long line fisheries. But another big problem is that plastic floats on the surface. And so plastics have not been, there was no plastic in the ocean 50 years ago. And so there's no concept of these birds evolutionarily that plastic isn't something they, they should not swallow. It's something on the sea surface that they'll grab. And they will regurgitate it to their chicks. And so this was taken from National Geographic. This is a six month old albatross and the body is loaded, the body cavity was loaded with plastic that was fed to it by its parent. And this is one of a two page spread of the plastic that came out of the body cavity of that six month old chick. And so the question is, well, why do tube noses eat plastic? Um, and it turns out, if you remember, I said the open ocean is a desert and it, it, you know, food is mostly not available in the open ocean. But in areas where you have upwelling, you have nutrients that are gonna support the phytoplankton and support in the uh, Antarctic, the krill, or in the Arctic, the amphipods and copepods, it's gonna support the herbivores that are gonna support the squid. And so if you have krill or other 
other herbivores feeding on the phytoplankton, it gives off a chemical called dimethyl sulfide. And so when squid are feeding in the area, of course, the squid are feeding on the, on the krill and the krill are feeding on the phytoplankton. Plankton. So there's this big cloud of dimethyl sulfide that with that great sense of smell, these tube noses are using to find the source of food and find where there's abundant squid or in the Northern hemisphere fish. And then some scientists did an experiment with it where they took small pieces of plastic and put it in seawater. And in about three weeks, enough phytoplankton or algae grew on the plastic that there was dimethyl sulfide both in the water and the air around that plastic. And it's that dimethyl sulfide that's attracting those birds to eat that plastic. So if you go to the Antarctic Peninsula, you will see three species of penguin. You'll see the Adelie penguin, and then you'll also see chin strap penguins and gin tooth penguins. And notice the gin tooths and the chin straps are more closely related to each other than they are to the Adelies. Um, the gin tooths tend to be the most northward distributed species. The Adelies are the most, are the species that are distributed in the south because they're ice dependent and they're krill dependent. And the chin straps are in between, but these guys will overlap in ranges. And our first stop was Deception Island. And these were my first penguins I've ever seen in the wild. And they're just beautiful. They're, they're small penguins, but uh, it was breeding season. And these guys were still incubating their eggs on Deception Island. And then we saw different penguin species on different islands. We saw Gentoo penguins on Coverville Island. And I, they, I think they're just little clown-like beautiful penguins. And they will eat, they'll eat fish in the northern part of their range and, and krill in the southern part of their range. And their chicks had hatched. And so we got to watch them feeding their chicks and, and all those kinds of activities while we were on Hooverville Island. And we did see leopard seals because leopard seals will cruise the edge of the penguin colonies during breeding season. And they will take penguins as they're coming in with food to feed their chicks. But this big giant seal, it's kind of amazing because they're actually krill specialists. And again, remember krill is kind of a keystone species in the area. So if you look at the skull of an elephant seal, which, which eats fish, you can see the peg-like premolars and molars that allow it to grab the fish, where the leopard seals have grooves in their teeth that are adapted to allow the animal, this big giant animal is actually filter feeding on krill. And so what it'd do is it, where, when there's swarms of krill, it'd take a big mouthful of krill, close its mouth, have these teeth overlap, and then in these little teeny tiny gaps in the teeth, it will take its tongue, it will force out the water, and then take a big gulp of krill. And so, and the crab eater seal, seals and the leopard seals are, are krill, there are two seals you can see in the Antarctic Peninsula that are krill specialists. And then the southern, again, the southernmost uh, species of penguin that feeds primarily on krill and depends on sea ice is the Adelie penguin. And so again, the, the three species, if you go to the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, the three species of penguins you'll see will be the Adelie penguin, the chin strap penguin, and the Gentoo penguin, which are all both fairly, all very fairly small penguins, but just very interesting and, and beautiful animals. Then some other miscellaneous birds that we saw when we were on this trip, we saw lots of Antarctic shags, which are endemic to the Antarctic Peninsula and the South Shetland Islands. Uh, Arctic terns spend, spend their time in, the Antar in Antarctica in the Antarctic summer when it is uh, winter in the Arctic. They breed in the Arctic, so they fly 25,000 miles, which I, I find amazing. Uh, black browed albatrosses were very common once we uh, were in the Southern Ocean. They're a medium sized uh, albatross that's circumpolar in the Southern Ocean. Cape petrels, also called pintado petrels, were, were very common. 
And then the snow petrel was not common. This is a lousy picture one. Apparently we were very lucky to see it. Uh, the snow petrel is one of three, three species of birds you can see at the geographic South Pole. The other one is the Antarctic petrel and the South Polar skua. We saw lots of South Polar skuas, which will uh, prey on snow petrels. But what we saw them doing was hanging around the uh, edges of penguin colonies and taking the eggs and chicks from the edges of, of penguin colonies. Uh, we also saw lots of kelp gulls, which are, which are very common in the Southern Hemisphere. We spent three days in South Georgia. I don't have time to, so uh, I'm not gonna show you uh, many pictures other than this one species of penguin we saw there, but uh, elephant seals and incre incredible history with explorers and uh, an island we went to where alb wandering albatrosses and giant petrels were breeding where we could see them on the nest. So you know, highly recommended if you get a chance, do take the longer trip. But we did see king penguins, which are very similar in appearance to emperor penguins. And the Salisbury Plain, absolutely amazing. Just a huge colony of breeding uh, penguins. And again, no fear of humans here. And so we were standing away from the colony and some of these young ones would approach us and actually chew on the, uh, on the straps that were coming off our backpacks. And so no fear of humans at all. And then we spent a couple of days in the Falkland Islands. Again, I don't have time to, to show you much from that, but I will show you the two species of penguins, uh, one from George Island and one from Bleecker Island. We saw Magellanic penguins on, uh, on George Island. Uh, they were in their burrows. They have a bare area of skin on their head that allows them to dump heat because they're found a little further north and overheating can be a problem. And then very beautiful and interesting to watch rock hopper penguins on, uh, on Bleecker Island. Red eyes. So now to the Antarctic. Um, when I went to the Antarctic, went to uh, Svalbard, which is halfway between, it's halfway between the Arctic Circle and the North Pole. And it's a, and so it's significantly inside the Arctic Circle. I had done no research before I'd done this trip. And so I blind, I had just gotten back from Borneo. I had hurt my knee badly in Borneo. And the gal said, well, if you think you can do the trip, if you can't get off the boat, you know, come anyway. So I went and we landed in Oslo. And then I was surprised when we changed planes, how far north we still had to fly after landing in Oslo, Norway. And so Svalbard, Svalbard is, is very far north. Uh, when we got there, I, I fly economy. And so I'm exhausted because I don't sleep well on a plane. So we always get there a day early to recover before the trips. And so we were gonna stay in a room in the, the Svalbard hotel. They didn't have a room, so they gave us an apartment, which was quite nice. We got to spread out. And they told us, make sure you go to the grocery store before five o'clock because the store closes at five o'clock. And so we went to the store and we bought some wine and breakfast and snacks. And uh, it's a good thing we did because this is what it looked like the next morning outside the, the window of our apart apartment. With 24 hours of light, people in this area don't get up very early. And so if we hadn't bought some food for breakfast, the cafes weren't open, the grocery store was open, nothing was open in the morning when we got up. The, the town was, it's, it's not a big town, a population a little under 2,500, mostly young people. It's a, it's a tough place to live. But we went there because I was, we were taking, Jean and I were taking a, a, a photo tour called Polar Bears of Svalbard. And for the trip, we got on this small expedition cruise cruise ship. And there were 12 of us. This is our group. And we spent 11 days on this expedition cruise ship, cruising around with no strict itinerary to look for polar bears or find anything, anything, you know, birds, any, any kind of wildlife we could see. Our leader was Susie Esterhaus. She's an incredible conservation photographer. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, her Facebook page has tons. She puts out great information uh, almost daily on Facebook 
Um, and she sells children's books. She does photographs for children's books and donates the proceeds to conservation organizations. Uh, an incredible woman. And it just this was a, a great group of people. It's always nice to travel with a, with a small group like this. And so as typical, we got on our small ship in the afternoon and then, it, and then motored on and spent most of the night motoring to get to this area. We did a number of ship cruises and also made a stop to see walruses and then later moved on. And as far as we got on this whole trip was to Wallenberg Fjord. And then after we got this far, then we worked our way back to the town of Longyearbyen. And so our first stop was to see Atlantic walruses. And that was, this was an animal I talked about when I taught marine biology, but I'd never seen a walrus. So it was really fun for me to, to be able to see a walrus in the wild. Um, and these, we took the Zodiacs to the beach and they were hauled out on the beaches. Their tusks are, are modified canines. They, they grow throughout the life of the animal. They're used to establish dominance hierarchies to, put breathing holes in the ice. And in a Zodiac, if they're near you, they can be dangerous because they've been known to puncture, puncture Zodiacs with those tusks. But they're curious. And so as we were sitting on the beaches, these guys were swimming by and they decided to come in on the beach and to check us out. And this guy rolled around and gave us a show. But what's kind of neat that you can see in this picture too, is you can see they have a pretty good set of whiskers, also known as vibrissae. And what these guys feed on is they feed on bivalves. They feed on things like clams and, and mussels that are in the ocean bottom. And they use these vibrissae, which are very sensitive to be able to find the clams and mussels. When we were in the town, since we had a, a day to talk to the locals and shop and we went to a photo museum and we went to, we, did, we had a really nice time that day we spent in town before we met up with our, our group. And climate change has been really, really rapid. And, and people have seen changes, not just in their lifetime, but seen recent changes that, that they're really concerned about. And 20 years ago, sea ice completely surrounded Svalbard. And, and on our trip, we saw no sea ice at all on the entire trip in the inlets and fjords. And, and that's, a, that's a big change. Now we did see ice, but all the ice that we did see was ice from cal calving glaciers. I mean, this is a huge glacier here and we did see lots of glaciers and we, we would see animals hauled out on that ice. And, if we stand to lose this ice, we really do stand to lose an entire ecosystem. It's, 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 really, um, it's really disturbing. Uh, loss of sea ice is crowded polar bears that would normally be spread over vast areas into areas with calving glaciers. And on this particular trip, of course, when you go on a photo trip to photograph wildlife, there's no guarantee. And, and Susie said, there's no guarantee we, we will see polar bears on this trip. Well, we saw lots of different polar bears on this trip. And, and probably the reason was loss of sea ice because these guys were crowded into areas with calving glaciers. And that's exactly where we would see them. This, this, this big bear is, is sitting on a piece of ice that came off a glacier. Uh, and lots of animals use this ice. So, uh, pelagic birds, this black gillamount, the walruses will haul up on the, on the ice and we saw lots of them. And then the polar bears will use the ice as a platform to find seals. Well, how can melting ice wipe out an entire ecosystem? Well, ice in the Arctic or in the Antarctic is kind of like the soil in the garden because your photosynthetic organisms, your algae, or if you want to call it phytoplankton, it's growing on the underside of the sea ice. And just like if you're growing a garden, you're growing those photosynthetic organisms. Those things you're growing in your garden are growing in the soil. Well, this stuff is growing on the underside of the sea ice. So it's, it's the soil of the garden. And this stuff that's growing on the underside of the sea ice supports herbivores, which support the carnivores, the small carnivores, which support the seals, which support the polar bears. So this is a, a photograph by Paul Nicklin, who is uh, uh, 
hero and a, a National Geographic photographer and kind of a hero of mine. And he he dives in these polar regions, and this is a this is he's on the underside of the sea ice, and these are all amphipods swarming around on the underside of the sea ice, feeding on that phytoplankton that grows on the underside. And then with the loss of the sea ice, one thing that surprised scientists is it's actually accelerating the melting and the rise of surface temperatures, because ice is white and it reflects solar radiation. Just like a white t-shirt is gonna be cooler on a hot day because it's reflecting sunlight, that ice is gonna reflect the sunlight. But when you start getting the sea ice melting, you get the open ocean exposed, which is dark. And that dark ocean absorbs heat and accelerates the heating of the surface temperatures. And whoops. Polar bears that have access, continuous access to, to sea ice can hunt throughout the year. And we're having these years where we we're getting these big melts of sea ice and with no ice, they have to spend a lot of time on land. And when they're spending time on land, they're living on their fat reserves. And this is a skinny polar bear, probably not due to lack of sea ice, but, but because it was a subadult. But uh, we did not spend much time with him. We did not want to harass him because he was not in good shape. But the subadults are poor hunters. And if they're poor hunters, they're going to have low fat content. And so many of them will starve to death. Whereas if you, once they make it to adulthood, they have a very high survivorship. They, they live a long time once they make it to adulthood in absence of climate change. Um, and so this is a big, healthy male adult polar bear. Yeah. And these are the biggest mammalian land plant predators that we have on the planet. Uh, uh, adult male, male polar bears average about 940 pounds. They can weigh as much as 2,000 pounds. Uh, the females weigh about half as much. And so we would cruise around in these zodiacs and we'd look for polar bears on the ice or uh, we spent a lot of times watching polar bears sleeping on the beaches. And that's where Susie did a really good job with uh, the people on this trip because she really emphasized that people be very, very quiet. And so sometimes we'd sit for a half hour, 45 minutes, not making one sound and watch a sleeping polar bear. And then all of a sudden he'd get in, get up, get in, get in the water and swim right beside us. And so this is a polar bear we spent a lot of time with. We even named him, we called him Big Boy. And he did a lot of, he did a lot of sleeping, but a lot of other behaviors for us. But something to point out, notice those huge feet on this guy. Polar bears are very, oops, polar bears are, are really good swimmers and those huge feet can be used for oars. And then on the bottom of the feet, they have papillae or ridges that actually provide friction on the ice so they don't slip around on the ice. And then again, those big feet can act as snowshoes. Well, this guy was hunting bearded seals. Um, polar bears eat ring seals and bearded seals. We did not see any ring seals on this trip, but we did see bearded seals, which are, which are much larger than the ring seals. And so they're primarily taken by, by male polar bears. And so he would get into the water and swim around. As I mentioned, they're very good swimmers. Polar bears have been known to swim as far as 100 miles. And he'd swim around and he'd get up on the ice and he'd rest and then he'd look around. And one time he actually did find a bearded seal and we, he missed him. We actually, I didn't get the pictures that happened so fast and I, I forgot about my camera. I was so fascinated watching, but uh, we actually did get, see him go and go after and, and miss catching a bearded seal. Uh, so that was a, a really, really fun thing to watch. And then we would see on the, on the calved ice glaciers, we saw lots of walruses. Um, the, by sitting on the ice, it allows them to remain near muscle beds without expending a lot of energy. This one happens to be with a very large youngster. Uh, and apparently the females will remain with their young uh, up to three years. And, and this is a, a pretty old youngster that's with that female. 
We got to go on land uh, a couple of times. We went on land once to photograph Arctic foxes, and then we went on land a, a, another time to, to photograph puffins. Pol polar bears are apex predators. They can be aggressive. And so before we got out of the Zodiacs, one guide would sit with us. We were on a French boat and these are our two French guides. They were a married couple, Agnes and, and Samuel. But anyway, they had uh, horns to scare the bears. So they would blast a horn if a bear came in the area. They had pepper spray, but they also had rifles. And we never had an encounter with a bear, but if they if they had to, they would, they would shoot a, a an aggressive bear to protect human life. Uh, going up to try and find the foxes, we saw uh, Svalbard reindeer, which is a, a small endemic subspecies of reindeer. And they knew that there was an Arctic fat fox den in the area because the dens of Arctic foxes are common in the summertime in the tundra on the cliffs with breeding seabirds. And there were breeding seabirds in the area. These are uh, black-legged kittiwakes that were nesting very close to where I, I took that picture of that, uh, that Arctic fox. When I was in Borneo before I was on this trip, I, I tore the cartilage in my right knee. And so I was hobbling along and I couldn't keep up with the group. And so when they moved on a little bit, I, I sat there quietly. Where, where that fox in the previous picture was sitting and just watched him. And I was so lucky. It was just kind of a magical moment for me because he got up and walked past me and started going up this hillside. And uh, I never expected to see a, 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 such a close, close up view of an Arctic fox and a, it just a, a very beautiful animal in my opinion. Also saw ptarmigan, which one of the few year-round year resident birds. And so during the winter, the foxes will eat ptarmigan. They'll also eat carrion. And they'll also eat, uh, follow polar bears and eat the leftovers from a polar bear kill. Um, but starvation is in the wintertime is probably the biggest cause of mortality for Arctic foxes. And then here we were quite lucky because we would not have been able to visit this area if the seas were rough. Um, our guides called this area the bird cliffs and it was something they wanted us to see. Uh, just an incredible colony of thick-billed mures. The smell and the noise was absolutely amazing. You definitely wanted to have a hat on or you would, uh, you got lots of white spots on your head in this area, uh, but very interesting. And so again, nesting precariously on cliffs because in the Arctic you have predators, unlike in the Antarctic where you have penguins all over the ground. And sort of an interesting thing, the young will fledge before they can fly. And, they, and so they literally jump off the cliffs before they can fly. And when they do that, they, they'll typically, the, a group will fledge at around the same time of day during the fledgling period. And the reason they do this is that synchronous exit floods the local gulls and foxes with potential prey. It's, it's called predator swamping or predator dilution. If you have a whole bunch of prey at once, then the predators can only take a small proportion of them. Uh, you see that same thing in the African in the African savanna, where antelope will have their babies. You know, almost at the same time, they'll have their babies synchronously. And when the young jump off the cliffs, uh, this glaucous gull uh, grabbed one in midair. So gulls will capture them in midair after they they jump off the cliffs. And then foxes will cruise the beaches and, and take them when they land on the ground before they get to the sea. But when they do jump, a parent will accompany the fledgling on its descent. And then once they get to the ocean, the male will stay with that fledgling and they'll stay with that chick for about eight weeks and continue to feed it until it's, it's old enough to, to go off and take care of itself and be on its own. So that was, a, that was a, a kind of a magical moment for me on the trip to be able to see that kind of stuff. 
And then a, another magical moment was to see this polar bear with its two young up close and personal. What we had done, it was a very foggy day and these bears were way up on a hillside in the fog. It was so foggy and they were so small because they were so far up, that, far up that hillside, we could barely see them. But again, Susie trained our group to be very quiet. And so we took the Zodiacs and we ran them up on the beach and we just sat there quietly for a, a period of time. I don't know how long, but it was a significant period of time. And amazingly, the fog lifted and these guys came down the hill, right and walked right in front of us while we were sitting in the Zodiacs, got in the water and swam to an island that was right behind us. And so here's the cute little cubs coming down the hill. And then there they are in the water, swimming to an island right behind us. And then I learned later, they kept this distance. They maintained this distance during the whole swim. Apparently this cub is holding on to the hind leg of its mother. And this cub is holding on to the hind leg of its sibling. And the mother is dragging them across the water to get to that island. And so just quickly looking at time, um, characteristics of seabirds, we've talked about the long life. Once they hit adulthood, they live a long time. They're monogamous. They typically only lay one egg and they invest a heck of a lot of energy in, uh, in raising the young. And it takes, many, it takes several years for them to reach maturity. So when an albatross, uh, fled, when a fledgling leaves the island, They'll be out to sea a couple of years before they, before they come back to reproduce. And so, well, what about puffins? Well, you saw the mirrors look something like penguins and, and puffins and mirrors are both deep pursuit suit divers. They pursue their prey by flying underwater, just like penguins. So they fill the, uh, they fill the ecological niche of a penguin. And puffins are pursuit divers, so they literally fly underwater like penguins. But penguins are flightless birds. Puffins can fly in the air, but they have short wings and they're very awkward flying in the air. It takes them a lot of effort to fly in the air because they are adapted for flying underwater. And so they have huge flight muscles. Uh, the two flight muscles are the pectoralis muscle, which pulls the wing down, and the supracoracoideus muscle, which pulls the wing up. If you ever eat a chicken breast, look for these two muscles, try and separate them, and you'll, you'll see those two muscles. And so here I am photographing puffins with my French guide, Agnes. And here's a guy that just landed. He just came in for a landing. Look at those short wings. And look at those huge pectoral muscles okay, adapted for flying underwater. And then, of course, it's breeding season. So notice the very bright orange bill and the bright orange feet. And that bright orange color is an indication that they're very healthy because the orange color comes from concentrating a pigment, that, a pigments called carotenoids that they get from the fish they eat. And so if, they're, if, if, if they have this bright orange color, that indicates they've eaten lots of fish and they're nice and healthy. Well, seabird populations all over the world are declining. And a lot of the reasons they're declining are unknown. And some of the reasons they're declining, I found this study uh, just by happen chance. I, I don't even remember how I, how I came across it. But it explains one of the reasons why, why puffins are declining, and it has, a, has to do with a change in ocean temperatures. Historically, the food chain for, for puffins is you have the phytoplankton or the algae on the underside of the sea ice, and then you have your herbivores. In this case, it's a, a copepod called Calanus femarchius. I'm not going to call it Calanus femarchius. I'm going to call it a high-fat copepod. Well, what feeds on that high fat copepod? Sand eels. And puffins feed on sand eels, and they also take those sand eels to their chicks. Well, why is this copepod a high fat copepod? Why does it store fat? It stores fat because it hibernates. And so what it does is it lives on those fat reserves during hibernation. But there's been a change in abundance in that high fat copepod since 1960. 
If you look at this graph between 1960 and, and the year 2000, we see a big decline in high fat copepods. And that's due to rising sea temperatures. With increased sea temperatures, what we're seeing is an increase in a low fat copepod. So rising sea temperatures lead to a decline in high fat copepods and increase in low fat copepods. And so you get a low fat copepod replacing our high fat copepod and you get skinny sand eels. And not only do you get skinny sand eels, but you get warm water predators moving in like mackerel that also feed on sand eels. So you've got thinner sand eels, you've got fewer sand eels, and you've got hungry seabirds. And remember, these guys are long lived. If they can't produce young one year, then they'll live another year and produce them another year. And so if they are too hungry, if they don't have enough fat on them, they'll stop feeding their chicks, they'll abandon their young, and the chicks will die. And of course, what's going to happen to any bird population if no young are produced? And so that's at least one of the reasons uh, why puffins are declining. And then to end, just a, a few other birds that we saw, uh, Arctic terns. And so uh, I did not realize until I was preparing for this talk that I saw an Ant Antarctic tern both in the Arctic and its breeding grounds and then in the Antarctic. And so I thought that was kind of neat. I hadn't looked at those pictures in, in many years. Um, and then Sabine's gull, the guides were very thrilled that we saw this because apparently they're, they're very rare in the Svalbard area, uh, but their breeding grounds are in the Arctic. But when they aren't in their breeding grounds, they're actually most, they're a pelagic bird that spends its time south of the equator, hanging around areas where there's upwelling in, in nutrients. And then we saw black guillemots, uh, not an abundance of them, but we said, did see black guillemots. And then I showed you by the fox den, the, that breeding area of the black legged kittiwakes, we saw lots of, of black legged kittiwakes. And this picture tells me that uh, this is the end of my slideshow. So I will uh, be happy to answer questions if you have any.